Chapter 18 A tree branch hung in the open window. The leaves moved against the sky, implying sun and summer and an inexhaustible earth to be used. Dominique thought of the world as background. Wynand thought of two hands bending a tree branch to explain the meaning of life. The leaves drooped, touching the spires of New York skyline far across the river. The skyscrapers stood like shafts of sunlight, washed white by distance and summer. A crowd filled the county courtroom, witnessing the trial of Howard Rock. Rock sat at the defense table. He listened calmly. Dominique sat in the third row of spectators. Looking at her, people felt as if they had seen a smile. She did not smile. She looked at the leaves in the window. Gail Wynand sat at the back of the courtroom. He had come alone when the room was full. He had not noticed the stairs and the flashbulbs exploding around him. He had stood in the aisle for a moment, surveying the place as if there was no reason why he should not survey it. He wore a grey summer suit and a Panama hat with a drooping brim turned up at one side. His glance went over Dominique as over the rest of the courtroom. When he sat down, he looked at Rock. From the moment of Wynand's entrance, Rock's eyes kept returning to him. Whenever Rock looked at him, Wynand turned away. The motive which the state proposes to prove, the prosecutor was making his opening address to the jury, is beyond the realm of normal human emotions. To the majority of us it will appear monstrous and inconceivable. Dominique sat with Mallory, Heller, Lansing, Enright, Mike, and Guy Francone, to the shocked disapproval of his friends. Across the aisle, celebrities formed a comet. From the small point of Ellsworth Tuhi, well in front, a tale of popular names stretched through the crowd. Lois Cook, Gordon L. Prescott, Gus Webb, Lancelot Clucky, Ike, Jules Fowler, Sally Print, Homer Slaughter, Mitchell Layton. Even as the dynamite which swept the building away, his motive blasted all sense of humanity out of this man's soul. We are dealing, gentlemen of the jury, with the most vicious explosive on earth, the egotist. On the chairs and the window sills, on the aisles, pressed against the walls, the human mass was blended like a monolith except for the pale ovals of faces. The faces stood out, separate, lonely, no two alike. Behind each, there were the years of a life lived or half over, effort, hope, and an attempt, honest or dishonest, but an attempt. It had left on all a single mark in common, on lips smiling with malice, on lips loose with renunciation, on lips tight with uncertain dignity, on all the mark of suffering. In this day and age, when the world is torn by gigantic problems, seeking an answer to the questions that hold the survival of man in the balance, this man, attached to such a vague intangible, such an unessential, as his artistic opinions sufficient importance to let it become his sole passion and the motivation of a crime against society. The people had come to witness a sensational case, to see celebrities, to get material for conversation, to be seen to kill time. They would return to unwanted jobs, unloved families, unchosen friends, to drawing rooms, evening clothes, cocktail glasses and movies, to unadmitted pain, murdered hope, desire left unreached, left hanging silently over a path on which no step was taken, to days of effort not to think, not to say, to forget, and give in, and give up. But each of them had known some unforgotten moment, a morning when nothing had happened, a piece of music heard suddenly, and never heard in the same way again, a stranger's face seen on a bus, a moment when each had known a different sense of living. And each remembered other moments, on a sleepless night, on an afternoon of steady rain, in a church, in an empty street at sunset, when each had wondered why there was so much suffering 
and ugliness in the world. They had not tried to find the answer, and they had gone on living as if no answer was necessary. But each had known a moment when, in lonely, naked honesty, he had felt the need of an answer. A ruthless, arrogant egotist who wished to have his own way at any price. Twelve men sat in the jury box. They listened, their faces attentive and emotionless. People had whispered that it was a tough-looking jury. There were two executives of industrial concerns, two engineers, a mathematician, a truck driver, a bricklayer, an electrician, a gardener, and three factory workers. The impaneling of the jury had taken some time. Rourke had challenged many talesmen. He had picked these twelve. The prosecutor had agreed, telling himself that this was what happened when an amateur undertook to handle his own defense. A lawyer would have chosen the gentle types, those most likely to respond to an appeal for mercy. Rourke had chosen the hardest faces. Had it been some plutocrat's mansion, but a housing project, gentlemen of the jury, a housing project. The judge sat erect on the tall bench. He had grey hair and the stern face of an army officer. A man trained to serve society, a builder who became a destroyer. The voice went on, practiced and confident. The faces filling the room listened with a the response they granted to a good weekday dinner, satisfying and to be forgotten within an hour. They agreed to every sentence. They had heard it before. They had always heard it. This was what the world lived by. This was self-evident, like a puddle before one's feet. The prosecutor introduced his witnesses. The policeman who had arrested Rock took the stand to tell how he had found the defendant standing by the electric plunder. The night watchman related how he had been seen away from the scene. The testimony was brief. The prosecutor preferred not to stress the subject of Dominique. The contractor superintendent testified about the dynamite missing from the stores on the side. Officials of Cortland, building inspectors, estimators took the stand to describe the building and the extent of the damage. This concluded the first day of the trial. Peter Keating was the first witness called on the following day. He sat on the stand, slumped forward. He looked at the prosecutor obediently. His eyes moved once in a while. He looked at the crowd, at the jury, at Rourke. It made no difference. Mr. Keating, will you state under oath whether you designed the project described to you, known as Cordland Holmes? No, I didn't. Who designed it? Howard Rourke. At whose request? At my request. Why did you call on him? Because I was not capable of doing it myself. There was no sound of honesty in the voice, because there was no sound of effort to pronounce a truth of such nature. No tone of truth or falsehood, only indifference. The prosecutor handed him a sheet of paper. Is this the agreement you signed? Keating held the paper in his hand. Yes. Is this Howard Rock's signature? Yes. Will you please read the terms of this agreement to the jury? Keating read it aloud. His voice came evenly, well drilled. Nobody in the courtroom realized that his testimony had been intended as a sensation. It was not a famous architect publicly confessing incompetence. It was a man reciting a memorized lesson. People felt that they were interrupted. He would not be able to pick up the next sentence, but would have to start all over from the beginning. He answered a great many questions. The prosecutor introduced in evidence Rock's original drawings of Cortland, which Keating had kept, the copies which Keating had made for them, and photographs of Cortland as it had been built. Why did you object so strenuously to the excellent structural changes suggested by Mr. Prescott and Mr. Webb? I was afraid of Howard Rock. What did your knowledge of his character lead you to expect? Anything. What do you mean? I don't know. I was afraid. I used to be afraid. The questions went on. The story was unusual, but the audience felt bored. 
It did not sound like the recital of a participant. The other witnesses had seemed to have more personal connection with the case. When Keating left the stand, the audience had the odd impression that no change had occurred in the act of the man's exit, so as if no person had walked out. The prosecution rests, said the district attorney. The judge looked at Wark. Proceed, he said. His voice was gentle. Rock got up. Your Honor, I shall call no witnesses. This will be my testimony and my summation. Take the oath. Rock took the oath. He stood by the steps of the witness stand. The audience looked at him. They felt he had no chance. They could drop the nameless resentment, the sense of insecurity which he aroused in most people. And so, for the first time, they could see him as he was. A man totally innocent of fear. The fear of which they thought was not a normal kind, not a response to a tangible danger, but a chronic, unconfessed fear in which they all lived. They remembered the misery of the moments when in loneliness a man thinks of the bright words he could have said but had not found and hates those who robbed him of his courage. The misery of knowing how strong and able one is in one's own mind the radiant picture, never to be made real. Dreams? Self-delusion? Or a murdered reality unborn? Killed but corroding emotion without name? Fear? Need? Dependence? Hatred? Rourke stood before them as each man stands in the innocent of his own mind. But Rourke stood like that before a hostile crowd, and they knew suddenly that no hatred was possible to him. For the flash of an instant, they grasped the manner of his consciousness. Each asked himself, Do I need anyone's approval? Does it matter? Am I tied? And for that instant, each man was free. Free enough to feel benevolence for every other man in the room. It was only a moment, the moment of silence, when Rock was about to speak. Thousands of years ago, the first man discovered how to make fire. He was probably burned at the stake he had taught his brothers to build. He was considered an evildoer who had dealt with a demon mankind dreaded. But thereafter man had fire to keep them warm, to cook their food, to light their caves. He had left them a gift they had not conceived, and he had lifted darkness off the earth. Centuries later, the first man invented the wheel. He was probably torn on the rack he had taught his brothers to build. He was considered a transgressor who ventured into forbidden territory. But thereafter man could travel past any horizon. He had left them a gift they had not conceived, and he had opened the roads of the world. That man, the unsubmissive and first, stands in the opening chapter of every legend mankind has recorded about its beginning. Prometheus was chained to a rock and torn by vultures because he had stolen the fire of the gods. Adam was condemned to suffer because he had eaten the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Whatever the legend, somewhere in the shadows of its memory, mankind knew that its glory began with one, and that that one paid for his courage. Throughout the centuries, there were men who took first steps down new roads, armed with nothing but their own vision. Their goals differed, but they all had this in common, that the step was first, the road new, the vision unburrowed, and the response they received? Hatred. The great creators, the thinkers, the artists, the scientists, the inventors, stood alone against the men of their time. Every great new thought was opposed. Every great new invention was denounced. The first motor was considered foolish. The airplane was considered impossible. The power loom was considered vicious. Anesthesia was considered sinful. But the men of unburrowed vision went ahead. They fought, they suffered, they paid, but they won. No creator was prompted by a desire to serve his brothers, for his brothers rejected the gift he offered, and that gift destroyed the slothful routine of their lives. His truth was his only motive, his own truth, and his own work to achieve in his own way. A symphony, a book, an engine, a philosophy, an airplane or a building, that was his goal and his life. Not those who 
heard, read, operated, believed, flew, or inhabited the thing he had created. The creation, not its users. The creation, not the benefits others derive from it. The creation which gave form to his truth. He held his truth above all things and against all men. His vision, his strength, his courage came from his own spirit. A man's spirit, however, is his self, that entity which is his consciousness. To think, to feel, to judge, to act are functions of the ego. The creators were not selfless. It is the whole secret of their power that it was self-sufficient, self-motivated, self-generated. A first cause, a fount of energy, a life force, a prime mover. The creator served nothing and no one. He lived for himself. Only by living for himself was he able to achieve the things which are the glory of mankind, such as the nature of achievement. Man cannot survive except through his mind. He comes on earth unarmed. His brain is his only weapon. Animals obtain food by force. But man has no claws, no fangs, no horns, no great strength of muscle. He must plant his food or hunt it. To plant, he needs a process of thought. And to hunt, he needs weapons. And to make weapons, a process of thought. From the simplest necessity to the highest religious abstraction. From the wheel to the skyscraper, everything we are and everything we have comes from a single attribute of man, the function of his reasoning mind. But the mind is an attribute of the individual. There is no such thing as a collective brain. There is no such thing as a collective thought. An agreement reached by a group of men is only a compromise or an average drawn upon many individual thoughts. It is a secondary consequence. The primary act, the process of reason, must be performed by each man alone. We can divide a meal among many men, but we cannot digest it in a collective stomach. No man can use his lungs to breathe for another man. No man can use his brain to think for another. All the functions of body and spirit are private. They cannot be shared or transferred. We inherit the products of the thought of other men. We inherit the wheel. We make a cart. And the cart becomes an automobile. The automobile becomes an airplane. But all through the process, what we receive from others is only the end product of their thinking. The moving force is the creative faculty which takes the product as material, uses it, and originates the next step. This creative faculty cannot be given or received, shared or borrowed. It belongs to single, individual man. That which it creates is the property of the creator. Men learn from one another, but all learning is only the exchange of material. No man can give another the capacity to think. Yet, that capacity is our only means of survival. Nothing is given to man on earth. Everything he needs has to be produced. And here man faces his basic alternative. He can survive in only one of two ways. By the independent work of his own mind, or as a parasite fed by the minds of others. The creator originates, the parasite borrows. The creator faces nature alone. The parasite faces nature through an intermediary. The creator's concern is the conquest of nature. The parasite's concern is the conquest of man. The creator lives for his work. He needs no other man. His primary goal is within himself. The parasite lives secondhand. He needs others. Others become his prime motive. The basic need of the creator is independence. The reasoning mind cannot work under any form of compulsion. It cannot be curbed, sacrificed, or subordinated to any consideration whatsoever. It demands total independence in function and in motive. To the creator, all relations with man are secondary. The basic need of the second-hander is to secure his ties with other men in order to be fed. He places relations first, he declares that man exists in order to serve others. He preaches altruism. Altruism is the doctrine which demands that man live for others and place others above himself. No man can live for another. He cannot share his spirit just as he cannot share his body. But the second-hander has used altruism as a weapon of exploitation and reversed the base of mankind's moral principles. Men have been taught every precept, 
that destroys the creator and have been taught dependence as a virtue. The man who attempts to live for others is a dependent. He is a parasite in motive and makes parasites out of those he serves. The relationship produces nothing but mutual corruption. It is impossible in concept. The nearest approach to it in reality, the man who lives to serve others, is the slave. If physical slavery is repulsive, how much more repulsive is the concept of servility of the spirit? The conquered slave has a vestige of honor. He has the merit of having resisted and of considering his condition evil. But the man who enslaves himself voluntarily in the name of love is the basest of creatures. He degrades the dignity of man and he degrades the conception of love. But this is the essence of altruism. Men have been taught that the highest virtue is not to achieve but to give. Yet one cannot give that which has not been created. Creation becomes before distribution, or there will be nothing to distribute. The need of the creator comes before the need of any possible beneficiary. Yet we are taught to admire the second-hander who dispenses gifts he has not produced above the man who made the gifts possible. We praise an act of charity, but we shrug at an act of achievement. Men have been taught that their first concern is to relieve the suffering of others. But suffering is a disease. Should one come upon it, one tries to give relief and assistance. To make that the highest test of virtue is to make suffering the most important part of life. Then men must wish to see others suffer in order that they may be virtuous. Such is the nature of altruism. The creator is not concerned with disease but with life. Yet the work of the creators has eliminated one form of disease after another in man's body and spirit and brought more relief from suffering than any altruist could ever conceive. Men have been taught that it is a virtue to agree with others, but the creator is the man who disagrees. Men have been taught that it is a virtue to swim with the current, but the creator is the man who goes against the current. Men have been taught that it is a virtue to stand together, but the creator is the man who stands alone. Men have been taught that the ego is the synonym of evil and selflessness the ideal of virtue. But the creator is the egotist in the absolute sense, and the selfless man is the one who does not think, feel, judge, or act. These are functions of the self. Here, the basic reversal is most deadly. The issue has been perverted, and men have been left no alternatives and no freedom. As poles of good and evil, he was offered two conceptions, egotism and altruism. Egotism was held to mean the sacrifice of others to self. Altruism, the sacrifice of self to others. This tied man irrevocably to other men and left him nothing but a choice of pain. His own pain born for the sake of others or pain inflicted upon others for the sake of self. When it was added that man must find joy in self-immolation, the trap was closed. Man was forced to accept masochism as his ideal under the threat that sadism was his only alternative. This was the greatest fraud ever perpetrated on mankind. This was the device by which dependence and suffering were perpetuated as fundamentals of life. The choice is not self-sacrifice or domination. The choice is independence or dependence. The code of the creator or the code of the second-hander. This is the basic issue. It rests upon the alternative of life or death. The code of the creator is built on the needs of the reasoning mind which allows man to survive. The code of the second-hander is built on the needs of a man incapable of survival. All that which proceeds from man's independent ego is good, and all that which proceeds from man's dependence upon man is evil. The egotist in the absolute sense is not the man who sacrifices others. He is the man who stands above the need of using others in any manner. He does not function through them, he is not concerned with them in any primary matter, not in his aim, not in his motive, not in his thinking, not in his desires, not in the source of his energy. He does not exist for any other man, and he asks no other man to exist for him. This is the only form of brotherhood and mutual respect possible between men. Degrees of ability vary, but the basic principle remains the same. The degree of a man's independence, 
initiative, and personal love for his work determines his talent as a worker and his worth as a man. Independence is the only gorge of human virtue and value. What a man is and makes of himself, not what he has or hasn't done for others. There is no substitute for personal dignity. There is no standard of personal dignity except independence. In all proper relationships, there is no sacrifice of anyone to anyone. An architect needs clients, but he does not subordinate his work to their wishes. They need him, but they do not order a house just to give him a commission. Men exchange their work by free, mutual consent to mutual advantage when their personal interests agree and they both desire the exchange. If they do not desire it, they are not forced to deal with one another. They seek further. This is the only possible form of relationship between equals. Anything else is a relationship of master and slave, or executioner and victim. No work is ever done collectively by a majority decision. Every creative job is achieved under the guidance of a single individual thought. An architect requires a great many men to erect his building but he does not ask them to vote on his design. They work together by free agreement, and each is free in his proper function. An architect uses steel, glass, concrete, produced by others. But the materials remain just so much steel, glass and concrete until he touches them. What he does with them is his individual product and his individual property. This is the only pattern for proper cooperation among men. The first right on earth is the right of the ego. Man's first duty is to himself. His moral law is never to place his prime goal within the persons of others. His moral obligation is to do what he wishes, provided his wishes does not depend primarily upon another man. This includes the whole sphere of the creative faculty, his thinking and his work. But it does not include the sphere of the gangster, the altruist and the dictator. A man thinks and works alone. A man cannot rob, exploit or rule alone. Robbery, exploitation and ruling presuppose victims. They imply dependence. They are the province of the second-hander. Rulers of man are not egotists. They create nothing. They exist entirely through the persons of others. Their goal is in their subjects, in the activity of enslaving. They are as dependent as the beggar, the social worker and the bandit. The form of dependence does not matter. But men were taught to regard second-handers, tyrants, emperors, dictators, as exponents of egoism. By this fraud, they were made to destroy the ego, themselves and others. The purpose of the fraud was to destroy the creators or to harness them, which is a synonym. From the beginning of history, the two antagonists have stood face to face, the creator and the second-hander. When the first creator invented the wheel, the first second-hander responded. He invented altruism. The creator denied, opposed, persecuted, exploited, went on, moved forward and carried all humanity along on his energy. The second-hander contributed nothing to the process except the impediments. The contest has another name. The individual against the collective. The common good of a collective, a race, a class, a state, was the claim and justification of every tyranny ever established over man. Every major horror of history was committed in the name of an altruistic motive. Has any act of selfishness ever equaled the carnage perpetrated by disciplines of altruism? Does the fault lie in man's hypocrisy or in the nature of the principle? The most dreadful butchers were the most sincere. They believed in the perfect society reached through the guillotine and the firing squad. Nobody questioned their right to murder, since they were murdering for an altruistic purpose. It was accepted that man must be sacrificed for other men. Actors change, but the course of the tragedy remains the same. A humanitarian who starts with declarations of love for mankind and ends in a sea of blood. It goes on and will go on, so long as men believe that an action is good if it is unselfish. That permits the altruist to act and forces his victims to bear it. The 
the leaders of collectivist movements ask nothing for themselves, but observe the results. The only good which man can do to one another and the only statement of that proper relationship is hands off. Now observe the results of a society built on the principle of individualism. This, our country, the noblest country in the history of man, the country of greatest achievement, greatest prosperity, greatest freedom. This country was not based on selfless service, sacrifice, renunciation or any precept of altruism. It was based on a man's right to the pursuit of happiness, his own happiness, no one else's, a private, personal, selfish motive. Look at the results. Look into your own conscience. It is an ancient conflict. Men have come close to the truth, but it was destroyed each time, and one civilization fell after another. Civilization is the progress toward a society of privacy. The savage's whole existence is public, ruled by the laws of his tribe. Civilization is the process of setting man free from man. Now, in our age, collectivism, the rule of the second-hander and second-rater, the ancient monster, has broken loose and is running amok. It was brought man to a level of intellectual indecency never equaled on earth. It has reached a scale of horror without precedent. It has poisoned every mind. It has swallowed most of Europe. And it is engulfing our country. I am an architect. I know what is to come by the principle on which it is built. We are approaching a world in which I cannot permit myself to live. Now you know why I dynamited Cortland. I designed Cortland. I gave it to you. I destroyed it. I destroyed it because I did not choose to let it exist. It was a double monster. In form and implication, I had to blast both. The form was mutilated by two second-handers who assumed the right to improve upon that which they had not made and could not equal. They were permitted to do it by the general implication that the altruistic purpose of the building superseded all rights and that I had no claim to stand against it. I agreed to design Cortland for the purpose of seeing it erected as I designed it and for no other reason. That was the price I set for my work. I was not paid. I do not blame Peter Keating. He was helpless. He had a contract with his employers. It was ignored. He had a promise that the structure he offered would be built as designed. The promise was broken. The love of a man for the integrity of his work and his right to preserve it are now considered a vague intangible and an unessential. You have heard the prosecutor say that. Why was the building disfigured? For no reason. Such acts never have any reason unless it's the vanity of some second-handers who feel that they have the right to anyone's property, spiritual or material. Who permitted them to do it? No particular man among the dozens in authority. No one cared to permit it or to stop it. No one was responsible. No one can be held to account. Such is the nature of all collective action. I did not receive the payment I asked. But the owners of Cortlet got what they needed from me. They wanted a scheme, devised to build a structure as cheaply as possible. They found no one else who could do it to their satisfaction. I could and did. They took the benefit of my work and made me contribute it as a gift. But I am not an altruist. I do not contribute gifts of this nature. It is said that I have destroyed the home of the destitute. It is forgotten that but for me, the destitute could not have had this particular home. Those who were concerned with the poor had to come to me, who have never been concerned, in order to help the poor. It is believed that the poverty of the future tenants gave them a right to my work, that their need constituted a claim on my life, that it was my duty to contribute anything demanded of me. This is the second-handers' credo now swallowing the world. I came here to say that I do not recognize anyone's right to one minute of my life, nor to any part of my energy, nor to any achievement of mine, no matter who makes that claim, how large their number or how great their need. 
I wish to come here and say that I am a man who does not exist for others. It had to be said. The world is perishing from an orgy of self-sacrificing. I wish to come here and say that the integrity of a man's creative work is of greater importance than any charitable endeavor. Those of you who do not understand this are the men who are destroying the world. I wished to come here and state my terms. I do not care to exist for any others. I recognize no obligations toward men except one, to respect their freedom and to take no part in a slave society. To my country, I wish to give the ten years which I will spend in jail if my country exists no longer. I will spend them in memory and in gratitude for what my country has been. It will be my act of loyalty, my refusal to live or work in what has taken its place. My act of loyalty to every creator who ever lived and was made to suffer by the force responsible for the Codland I dynamited. To every tortured hour of loneliness, denial, frustration, abuse he was made to spend, and to the battles he won, to every creator whose name is known, and to every creator who lived, struggled, and perished unrecognized before he could achieve, to every creator who was destroyed in body or in spirit, to Henry Cameron, to Stephen Mallory, to a man who doesn't want to be named, but who is sitting in this courtroom and knows that I am speaking of him. Rourke stood his legs apart, his arms straight at his sides, his head lifted as he stood in an unfinished building. Later, when he was seated again at the defense table, many men in the room felt as if they still saw him standing, one moment's picture that would not be replaced. The picture remained in their minds through the long legal discussions that followed. They heard the judge state to the prosecutor that the defendant had, in fact, changed his plea, he had admitted his act, but had not pleaded guilty of a crime. An issue of temporary legal insanity was raised. It was up to the jury to decide whether the defendant knew the nature and the quality of his act, or, if he did, whether he knew that the act was wrong. The prosecutor raised no objection. There was an odd silence in the room. He felt certain that he had won his case already. He made his closing address. No one remembered what he was saying. The judge gave his instructions to the jury. The jury rose and left the courtroom. People moved, preparing to depart, without haste, in expectation of many hours of waiting. Wynand, at the back of the room, and Dominique, in the front, sat without moving. A bailiff stepped to Rock's side to escort him out. Rock stood by the defense table. His eyes went to Dominique, went to Wynand. He turned and followed the bailiff. He had reached the door when there was a sharp crack of sound and a space of blank silence before people realized that it was a knock on the closed door of the jury room. The jury had reached a verdict. Those who had been on their feet remained standing, frozen, until the judge returned to the bench. The jury filed into the courtroom. The prisoner will rise and face the jury said the clerk of the court. Howard Rock stepped forward and stood facing the jury. At the back of the room, Gail Wynand got up and stood also. Mr. Foreman, have you reached a verdict? We have. What is your verdict? Not guilty. The first movement of Rock's head was not to look at the city in the window, at the judge, or at Dominique. He looked at Wynand. Wynand turned sharply and walked out. He was the first man to leave the courtroom.